Well, thank you very much. I'm grateful to a number of people, not least to uh, Hagel Panosian himself for uh, being the uh, moving force behind this invitation and also for providing me with a very delicious dinner before we started. <laughs> I'm very grateful to uh, Peter Cowie for a far too elaborate uh, introduction, <laughs> which is quite impossible for anyone to live up to. <laughs> and I'm very grateful to such a large crowd. Uh, coming, some of you have come uh, an incredible, at least incredible to me, distance just for this occasion. And I'm, I, I only hope you won't be too disappointed. <laughs> Give me time to change my glasses. Now, why study Armenian? <coughs> well, can you hear me? No, you can't. <laughs> okay, thank you. Theoretically, there is no limit to the number of reasons why someone might be interested in learning about Armenia and learning <coughs> Armenia, whether one's Armenian by descent or, or not. But having an interest in a subject is not the same as studying it. Nonetheless, uh, people are still asking me why I chose such a career, as if it were something odd. <laughs> so I thought that it might be interesting to reflect for a while on reasons for studying Armenia in a broader historical perspective with a few reflections from my own experience. Now, there's certainly nothing new about having an interest in Armenia. Back in the first millennium BC, a range of Greek and Roman authors had many occasions to write about Armenia, whether from personal experience or because they were professional scholars interested in the history, geography, and culture of that part of the world. In the time of the old Persian Empire, in 400 BC, for example, Xenophon and the Greek army <coughs> traversed Armenia from south to north on their way back to Greece. The detailed account of the country and of its inhabitants is our first real description of life in early Armenia. Then there's the geographer Strabo a little later, who was more of an armchair traveler, but his account of the world as known in the first century BC, centered in the Mediterranean, is a storehouse of information with an extensive description of Armenia and the surrounding lands. Now, curiosity about the world was a particularly Greek characteristic. And the Roman authors who give us information about Armenia, like Tacitus or Plutarch, were more interested in the military campaigns of Roman generals in the East. After all, Armenia played a prominent role in the expansion of the Roman Empire in Asia Minor, and in later times, Armenia was a major player in the political and military history of Byzantium. Nor must we forget the Arab writers, especially the geographers, who were interested in trade and the products of Armenia and the Caucasus. Many Armenians made careers for themselves in the Greco-Roman world and the Byzantine Empire. And conversely, Byzantine emperors were concerned with using internal Armenian politics as a way of exercising influence in the East. And in a similar fashion later on, in the period of the Crusades, interesting, excuse me, increasing interest in Armenia from a Catholic church is obvious, as they were anxious to bring the Christians of the Near East into their own fold. However, disregarding grand affairs of state, individuals on a personal scale could also be motivated to learn Armenian. You may be familiar with the name of Anania of Shirak, Shiragatsi, who lived in the 7th century. It was he who worked out the basis for the Armenian era, which was postdated to begin in 552 as year one. His grandest project, however, was an encyclopedia on the subjects that were taught in the superior schools of the time, which, alas, has not survived intact. The famous geography, 
the Ashkara Tzuitz, for example, was once, a, was once a part of it, but it's now known only as a separate work. In any event, Ananiah has left us a brief autobiography in which he describes his travels in search of learned teachers. And he found one in Trebizond, a Greek by the name of Tikichos, who had himself learned Armenian because he, he served in the Byzantine army in that part of the world. The learning of languages, of course, works both ways. <clears throat> From about the same time, there is a fascinating papyrus found in Egypt. It was written by an Armenian who wanted to improve his Greek. And he used the Armenian script to write out conversational phrases, the forms of verbs, lists of vocabulary, and improving maxims. Now, this sort of collection of topics is common enough in late antiquity. But to find one written in Greek using the Armenian script is, to say the least, unusual. Uh, much later on, as I'm sure many of you know, Armenians used their own script to write other languages, like Kipchak and then Ottoman Turkish. Word lists are useful for travelers in all countries at all times. There is, for example, an interesting list of Armenian words written in Latin script dating to the late 10th century. It includes the days of the week, the numbers, the parts of the body, some foods, always useful, and some basic Christian terms. We don't know who compiled this list, but it is known that there were Armenian travelers to Western Europe in the 10th century or later. Closer to home, once Armenians had moved into Cilicia and established settled principalities, one of which was later elevated into a kingdom, contacts with the West flourished, especially following the arrival of the Crusaders. This prompted foreigners to learn Armenian for the purposes of trade. Texts, both literary and practical, were translated into Armenian from Latin or Old French and mutual knowledge of each other's customs was encouraged by intermarriage. Travel accounts were composed, so people living far away would be able to learn about Armenia and its inhabitants. Outside Cilicia, in Armenia proper, important centers of learning and study developed in some of the major monasteries. One thinks of Glazo, Tatev, and many others. Not only did the scribes copy the great works of previous Armenian authors on a wide range of subjects, and Vardapets did teach the coming generation of students, scholars composed encyclopedic <coughs> collections presenting the sum of Armenian tradition alongside new works defending that tradition in opposition to non-Armenian ideas, especially the activity of Catholics. I myself would place the origin of Armenian studies in that climate of mutual debate and criticism. Because Armenian studies as we know them now involve two aspects. On the one hand, the collection and preservation of a tradition to prevent it being lost, and on the other, complementary to it, a learned and critical approach to that tradition in order to fully comprehend its ramifications and defend it against attack. And I shall come back to that point again later. A key factor in the development of Armenian studies in this sense was the printing press. For without the wider diffusion of knowledge about Armenia, both inside the country and out, knowledge of the Armenian tradition and debate about it would have been very circumscribed. As you know, the first Armenian books were printed in Italy, beginning in Venice in 1512, and they were designed primarily for merchants. These were small books, easy to carry about, 
with both serious and amusing contents, prayers and riddles, stories and poems. But as time passed, more serious works for study and reflection became available. Not only were grammars and dictionaries produced, thus encouraging knowledge of Armenian among non-speakers of the language, but serious works of controversy appeared, like the massive three volumes by Clement Galanus, entitled, not in English, but in Latin and in Armenian, The Union of the Armenian Church with the Church of Rome. This came out between 1650 and 1658. Galanus had been an active missionary in Poland, Armenia, and Constantinople. But the issues raised in that book remain with us still. Now, Catholics in the West did not have any monopoly on printing in the Armenian language, and those whose books could not receive a Catholic imprimatur went to Amsterdam, the common refuge in the 17th century for those persecuted for religious or intellectual opinions. The Armenian press there owed its origin to a certain Matthew Mateos Tsaretsi, a deacon who had been sent by the Catholicos from Echmerzin to Italy to find type for a press. But frustrated in Rome, he went on to Amsterdam, where, with a local engraver, he succeeded in creating type. And the first of, books, of the books published there in Amsterdam appeared in 1660. This was the famous poem, Jesus Vorti, by Nerses Schnorhalli. However, the most famous and significant product of that press was an Armenian Bible, the first printed Armenian Bible, named after Voskhan Yerevansi. <coughs> well, as the name uh, by which he's known indicates, Voskhan came from Yerevan, his parents, uh, he was born there, and they, his parents were among those deported to Isfahan by Shah Abbas. So he grew up in North Julfa. A press had been established there in 1636, but it didn't receive much support. And by 1650, only five books had been printed. And here, I am going to give a free plug, just as we heard earlier, for a lecture at UCLA by Dr. Sebu Aslanian, who is going to talk on Monday at noon in Royce Hall about the Armenian printing press in Nordrufa. Now, to return to Moscow. Voskhan became a monk and went to reside in Echmerzin, where he made the acquaintance of a Dominican from the West called Paul. And together they decided to collaborate in creating an Armenian Bible based on the Latin Bible. But the Dominican Paul did not receive permission to publish this in Rome. However, he and Voskhan set out together for Italy in the early 1660s and received some financial support from Armenian merchants in Livorno, which is on the coast of Italy towards the north. By this time, Boscan's brother, Avedis, had taken control of the press in Amsterdam, so <coughs> Boscan naturally moved there, and in 1666, his two-volume Bible appeared, the first printed Armenian Bible. And many other books followed, including the first Armenian history to be printed, the Book of Histories by Arakel of Tabriz. So the diffusion of knowledge about Armenia in the West got off to a rather slow start, but the pace gradually increased. And what began as an offshoot of missionary endeavors, on the Western side at any rate, now began to develop as an academic discipline. In 1711, a young German by the name of Joachim Schroeder published at Amsterdam again a grammar of classical Armenian. This was the first serious study of Armenian and was a vital tool in the next major step. Now, I just mentioned that Arakel's history had appeared in 1669. And 25 years later, the far better known history by Mopsis Khorenatsi 
was printed in Amsterdam by an Armenian bishop named Tovma. Then, using this grammar by Schroeder to study the language, two English brothers by the name of Wiston produced a Latin rendering of this history by Moses Chorinatsi in 1736. So, for the first time, scholars unfamiliar with the Armenian language had direct access to one of the basic Armenian sources. Fifty years later, this translation was used by the famous historian Edward Gibbon in the preparation of his renowned History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Now, I wouldn't say that Gibbon's direct reference to Mobses Khorinatsi made the Armenian a household name. In fact, Gibbon wasn't very polite about the Armenian historian's scholarship, but he praised him for his local information and enthusiasm. <clears throat> Nonetheless, within Armenian circles, the greatest impetus for learning and study came from Mukhitar of Sebasti. Even by the time he was ordained priest at the age of 20, that is, uh, in 1695, he already was fired with the aim to organize an Armenian community devoted to education and scholarship. And perhaps this ambition derived from his knowledge of contemporary controversy between Catholics and Armenians after he had read the work by Galadus, to which I referred earlier. Mukhita entered a pro-Catholic monastery near Erzurum, and it was elevated to the rank of Vardapet, but he found no support there with the idea of founding a community devoted to study and education. He had better success in Constantinople, where he established a school in Pira and set up his own printing press. But eventually he ran into too much opposition from the established community, so he and his followers, a small band of ten young men, decided to leave the Ottoman Empire, and they made their way to Methoni at the southern tip of the Peloponnese in Greece, which was then under Venetian control. Now here, Mokita organized his, co his community along monastic lines, and eventually gained papal recognition as an order under the rule of St. Benedict. Interestingly, this was the same rule that Nerses of Lampron had translated into Armenian more than 500 years previously. Anyway, war between Turkey and the Republic of Venice over possession of the Peloponnese intervened, and Mukhita and his followers had to leave. They took refuge in Venice, where they were given one of the islands in the lagoon, and since 1717, the Mukhitarist congregation has remained there until today. Now, the educational work of the Mechitarists had a profound impact on the Armenian communities of the Ottoman Empire. But that's not my theme today. Rather, I want to uh, look at their work and research on the history and literature of their people. And it was this that gave the great, greatest impetus to Armenian studies in Europe, primarily because of the place, Venice being easily accessible, and the language, because they published many of their works in French or Italian. The accomplishments of Mukhita and his followers have been described before. And here I shall only mention a few points before turning to my own connection with the Mukhitarists and my initiation into the mysteries of Armenia. By the 19th century, the Mikhitarists, however, were not the only group involved in the study of things Armenian. In the time of Napoleon, a school of Oriental languages was founded in Paris, originally to provide instruction in Arabic, Turkish, and Persian. But Armenian was added in 1812, and the institution flourishes to this day. At the Russian Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg, both literary and archaeological studies involving Armenia were undertaken. 
Many of the results were published in French, the lingua franca of the day. Uh, the British, I regret to say, were very slow off the mark. <laughs> Although there had been individual scholars interested in Armenia in the 19th century, and Nubar Pasha had endowed a scholarship at Oxford in 1926, not until after the Second World War was a university position specifically in Armenia created in London at the School of Oriental and African Studies. That was part of a government uh, initiative. And Charles Dowsett was the first holder of that position. In 1965, the Kalus Gorbengian Foundation established a chair of Armenian at Oxford. And in this country, of course, by that time, Armenian studies had already been established on a permanent footing through the efforts of NASA and the Armenian community, first at Harvard, then at UCLA. I'll say a little bit about the background to that in a moment. But let us return to the Makitarists. In 1773, a number of the fathers split away from the order on the island in Venice, and after a brief sojourn in Trieste, moved on to Vienna. And there they established themselves in 1812 with their own printing press, school, library, and monastic establishment. And it was at the Mahitarist Monastery in Vienna that I was introduced to Father Nerses Akinyan and began my study of Armenian. Uh, that requires us to step back a little. In the 1920s, a Harvard graduate by the name of Robert Peirce Casey of Irish-American stock from Dorchester, Massachusetts, gained his doctorate in the Faculty of Divinity in the University of Cambridge in England. He had a particular interest in the writings of the famous Athanasius of Alexandria, <coughs> mentioned already this, uh, this evening by Peter Carey, um, whose major works, that is uh, Athanasius' works, were translated into Armenian and other languages. On his way back to the USA at the outbreak of the Second World War, the ship on which he was traveling, the Athenia, was torpedoed, and Casey lost all his work from the previous 15 years. However, after the war, he was invited back to Cambridge in England <coughs> as Dean of Sydney Sussex College and lecturer in the Faculty of Divinity. And since I went to that college myself when I left school as an undergraduate to study classics, he introduced me to the study of Greek manuscripts. And on his death in 1959, I inherited his research materials on the manuscripts of the works by Athanasius. Now, Robert Casey was well aware of the value of Armenian and other translations of these Greek works. My own doctoral thesis was on the collection of uh, Athanasius that had been translated into Syria. And Casey insisted that I also learn Armenian. During his earlier travels, he had made friends with nurses uh, at Kinyan, at the Mokitaris Monastery in Vienna, and in fact they published some things together in the 1930s. Now you may know, and I'm sure you're well aware, in fact, that Nerses Akinyan was one of the most famous of the Mokitaris um, scholarly fathers, although not all his opinions about Armenian um, authors have received universal approbation, be that as it may. He had been born in Artvin in 1883. The town is now within the borders of Turkey, but at that time it was part of the Russian Empire and Catholic influence was strong in the area. Uh, by the age of 13, Nurses Akinyan was already a pupil at the Makhitaris Congregation in Vienna, and in 1901 he became a fully-fledged member. So. In 1957, I went to Vienna, met Father Akinian, and expressed my intention to study Armenian. On my unexpected appearance, Father Akinian put me in the charge of Father Boros de Borosian, 
And I used to go to the monastery several times a week for instruction. There was a slight problem. Since we had some difficulty, that is, Father Bobos and I, had some difficulty in communicating. <laughs> Father Bobos was from Tbilisi. So he had Georgian and Armenian as native tongues, and of course he spoke fluent German. My German was even worse then than it is now. <laughs> when I had uh, some other languages like French, Italian, and some modern Greek, but there was nothing much between us. However, I managed to struggle through the standard introduction to Armenian, still in use today, Antoine Meillet's Alt Armenische Grammatik, no, sorry, it's called Alt Armenisches Elementarbuch, which is um, still on the shelves for reference. On returning to Cambridge at the end of the summer, I followed this initiation by a more regular study in London with Charles Dowsing. So by the time that I presented my doctoral thesis at Cambridge, i have been able to introduce a good deal of Armenian evidence. Before finishing my thesis, however, I was lucky uh, to obtain a year's junior fellowship at Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, the Center for Byzantine Research, where Sir Rapi de Nersesia was a faculty member. More than any other person I can name, Serapi de Nersesian brought the study of Armenian illuminated manuscripts to the most sophisticated level, as well as to a wide and appreciative readership. She had been born in Constantinople and was the niece of the famous scholarly patriarch Malachia Ormanian. During the First World War, she and her sister escaped from the genocide via Bulgaria and reached Paris. And there, in later years, she succeeded in pursuing a scholarly career in Byzantine and Armenian art. In 1946, immediately after the Second World War, she joined the scholars at Dumbarton Oaks. This thus was created another strand in the formation of Armenian studies in the United States of America. Siraki influenced my career in two ways. First, during my year in Dumbarton Oaks, when I was finishing my thesis, she encouraged me to extend my Armenian interest into the Crusader medieval period, when the Armenians had created a kingdom in Cilicia. More importantly, in the long term, she put me in touch with the Department of Near Eastern Languages at Harvard University, where Abadis Sanjian, many of you may well know or have known, held the position that had already been created for Armenia, thanks to the efforts of NASA and the Armenian community. Not satisfied with the level of competence I had so far achieved, the department took me on as a research fellow, on the condition that I went to the University of Louvain in Belgium for further training with Professor Garit. Louvain is an ancient city of 20 miles or so east of Brussels. And its Catholic university was founded back in 1425. But from our point of view, it became famous much later, when the study of Armenian and of other Eastern Christian languages was established there in 1841. This was the initiative of Felix Nev, who published a good deal on Armenian historical and theological subjects. And by the end of the 19th century, Louvain was a leading center for the study of the Christian East. Six relevant languages were taught. Arabic, Christian Arabic, Armenian, Coptic, Ethiopic, Georgian, and Syrian. When I went there, the leading scholar of Armenian was Professor Garit, as I just mentioned, whom Harvard had already tried unsuccessfully to bring to the USA. So at Louvain, I improved my knowledge of classical Armenian and some of the other languages used by Christians of the Near East. And it was Professor Garit who put me on track for my first book on an Armenian subject, The Teaching of St. Gregory. 
and thanks to his support, I was later awarded an instructorship in classical Armenian and Syriac back in the Department of Near Eastern Languages at Harvard. So let us recap for the moment to consider the status of Armenian studies at the beginning of the 20th century. Within Armenian circles, the Mechitarists in Venice and Vienna were the leading promoters. Their publications in different European languages, as well as Armenian, brought things Armenian to a wider circle of interested scholars. In Western Europe and Russia, Armenian was taught at a few institutions, but that was primarily in the context of Eastern Christianity. There was as yet no university in Armenia proper, but several of the scholars associated with the Catholic Ossate in Echmerzin had studied in the West and were producing important monographs in German. In addition, there was the occasional private scholar, like Frederick Conibier in Oxford, who traveled regularly to Echmerzin to work on Armenian manuscripts, and he published extensively in English. Art historians had discovered the accomplishments of Armenian manuscript painters. Linguists had discovered the value of Armenian as early evidence for the Indo-European languages. Philologists were working on Armenian versions of lost texts, and historians were using Armenian histories in the broader study of the Near East. However, Armenian achievements were still subordinated to the study of other, more traditional fields. The investigation of the Armenian tradition for its own intrinsic value had hardly begun. What could be said about Armenian studies in the USA at that time? I've already mentioned Robert Casey, who introduced me to Father Nurses at Kinyan, and he published a number of texts in Armenian, but he never taught the language or history of Armenia. Another scholar who worked in Armenian was Ralph Marcus, professor of Hellenistic culture at the University of Chicago. His speciality was the Jewish philosopher Philo, who wrote in Greek. Philo's works interpreting Jewish traditions in the spirit of the Hellenistic Greek world circulated widely in Armenia. I could also mention here an ex machitarist Paul Esabalian, who studied the history of the New Testament. He taught Armenian for a while at Berkeley in the 1960s, but the position didn't continue. Likewise, uh, Neville Birdsall, a pupil of Robert Casey's, taught briefly at UCLA soon after Professor von Grunebaum expanded the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Birdsall was interested also in the Bible and did research in both Armenian and Georgian. He returned to Birmingham in England, but his research did not have any, sorry, his research did not lead to any regular teaching of Armenian. So, important for Armenian were the works of Casey, Marcus, and a few like them. But the interest of these scholars was more in what the Armenian evidence told them about something else about the Greek writings, for example. They were not involved in Armenian studies as we understand them now. That is, from their point of view, the importance of these translations for what they tell us about Armenia, the impact these works had on Armenian thought and culture, and the development of Armenian scholarly traditions. More important in this latter sphere, and perhaps more, much more widely known, was Robert Blake, who had a rather unusual early career before joining the Harvard faculty in the 1920s. Born in San Francisco, he attended Berkeley as an undergraduate, then moved to Harvard for graduate study. And before the First World War, he traveled widely on the continent, including Russia. His, intent, his interest in the languages of the Caucasus intensified during his stay in the Russian Empire. And in fact, he stayed there throughout the war, 
and the revolution. And in 1920, he married in Tbilisi the daughter of a local Russian judge. Back at Harvard, he pursued his work in Georgian and Armenia and was director of the university library in the late 20s to 1937. Uh, later on, I used his handwritten catalogue of Georgian books, for example. He was also closely associated with Dumbarton Oaks, where Serapi Dena Sessian had been appointed in 1946. Now, it was through one of his pupils that Blake's impact on the development of Armenian studies in the USA was most directly exercised. In 1949, Robert Blake and Richard Fry published the text of the Armenian historian Grigor of Akans, who described the Mongols and their relations with Armenia in the 13th century. Richard Fry, who alas died only a couple of weeks ago, became a specialist in Iranian and a distinguished member of the Department of Near Eastern Languages at Harvard. But he retained his interest in Armenian. And it was his discussions with Manu Young in 1954 that sparked the drive for funds to create a chair of Armenian studies and the National Association for Armenian Studies. Well, that was exactly 60 years ago. And much has happened since then across the USA. I shall not repeat the story of the rapid expansion of Armenian studies which is primarily due here to the support of individuals and of the Armenian community at large. I would simply now like to look back at some of the points I raised earlier. The first point is the preservation of the tradition, of the documents, the monuments, and other physical evidence of Armenian culture through the ages. The second point is the need for critical investigation of the tradition in order to promote a better understanding of its origins and development. And the third point is the imparting of that tradition to successive generations, not only to those of Armenian descent, but to the wider world. That is why it's so vital to place Armenian studies in their historical and cultural context, and to integrate them into the broader sweep of history in the most general sense. And the context for these activities is the modern university, with its emphasis on learning, teaching, and research. Hence, the study of things Armenian should no longer be considered something odd or unusual, but simply part of the accepted investigation of human culture as it was in the past and as it is now developing. Thank you very much. <laughs>